Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session, let's understand about real-time database or in-memory databases. We're going to talk about different use cases where you'll be using real-time databases and also understand why exactly we can't use relational databases. You'll also be learning about internal working of real-time databases, including indexing and also data structures like ABL tree. And I'm also going to talk about B plus tree in RDBMS, also how the crash recovery works in main memory databases. And later, we're also going to discuss about um, different performance characteristic and what are the advantages of using real-time databases also. You must be wondering why exactly I need to know the internals of real-time database because these clever design patterns will actually help you to design your own system at your job or interviews. Otherwise, at least you will be learning when exactly you need to use real-time database and you will be actually using in your systems. So let's go back to whiteboard and understand the internals of real-time database. Real-time database also called as main memory database or in-memory database for the fact that they use RAM or in-memory to save all of the data. Unlike RDBMS, they actually save all of the data in the disk. RDBMS was actually introduced in 1980s when the database evolution was happening and people doubted that RDBMS will not work, um, will really work for our use cases or not. But here we are, we are still using RDBMS these days also heavily. Now, the way they designed is initially was there was a SQL engine, there was a hard disk. All of the data was sitting in a hard disk and SQL engine actually queries uh, the disk directly, let's forget about this buffer pool for now, and then the data is actually fetched back uh, through the SQL engine and used it. But as the RAM prices dropped, okay, and the disks also got much cheaper, people started to think that why don't we just use RAM in between as a buffer pool to make RDBMS much faster and let the database still be present in the disk. So what they did is they introduced a buffer pool in between where a lot of data or a lot of frequently accessed data is actually kind of cached in the buffer pool. When the query actually comes to SQL engine, SQL engine basically checks in the cache or buffer pool and if the data is present, it used to retrieve it and give it here. And then if there are updates and uh, deletions or insertion happens, they're actually written in the both the places in disk and here. So it used to work that way. But people really thought in you know upcoming generation that why don't we just use RAM as the main place where we store the data instead of caching it in the RAM. So what people did was they totally removed the disk from the picture, but not really, but for the understanding purpose, let's remove the disk totally. And they used this RAM as the uh, main memory, okay? main memory for saving all of the data. Now, this is the basic architecture of uh, you know uh, real-time database. When the query comes in, the same SQL engine is still there, and then the SQL engine actually queries from the main memory or in memory to get the data which it needs, which it actually sits in the RAM. And if you know the difference between RAM and the hard disk or SSD performance, that is like huge, right? So here is the comparison. I've got some data from internet. Suppose if you want to read data from hard disk, that means that it actually, uh, we can read at the speed of 63 MB per second. So if the same data is read from solid state disk or SSD, which is usually a uh, go-to SSD for all of our virtual machines or you know, EC2 instances because of it is faster than hard disk. So there, the data read speed is about 457 MBs per second. But in the RAM, if you want to store the same data in RAM and read it, it will be like 4,600 MB per second. If you see the difference, when we read the data uh, from SSD, it is seven times faster than the hard disk. But the same data when we read from RAM, it is almost like 80 times faster than hard disk and also 10 times faster than SSD. So 10 times performance gain is a lot. This is what we are talking about, um, you know, real-time databases performance. So the simple change in the architecture from RDBMS, you, instead of using hard disk to RAM, gives around 100 times performance. So just to give an example, if a query in RDBMS takes about 100 millisecond, the same query for the same data in real-time database actually takes one millisecond. That's like 100 times performance gain for you know, read and write queries. 
So that's what we are talking about. Real-time databases are used to get like 100 times performance. There are a lot of different databases available. Aerospike, HANA DB from SAP, and there is Old DB, and there are so many other variants of real-time databases available which you can actually use it. So Redis and Memcached and also SQLite also falls into the same category, which also does the same thing. But Redis and Memcached doesn't really have a SQL support, but they are mostly like key value pairs. But underlying, they use a lot of same um, characteristic. So if you if you remember, I we actually we removed the disk totally from the design, but actually real-time databases also still use disk, but mostly to make the system more reliable. What they do is they basically store all the val file on the disk so that if the system actually crashes or if you want to restart, basically we can leverage the data which is there in the disk to repopulate all of the data back. Because for the fact that RAM is very volatile, that means that if the system crashes or restarts, basically RAM is like volatile. It means that it doesn't remember what it had. That means that all of the data in the databases will be gone. So we need disk still to have a copy of database and all the operation recently happened using vol file um, stored in the disk and then we load it back once the system is start. So for that, to understand much, uh, much clearly, we need to understand what is the difference between real-time databases and RDBMS or RAM-based database to disk-based databases. So the first thing is the cost is higher in RTDB because the fact that RAMs are costlier because all of the data is present on the RAM and RAMs are costlier, the operational cost to run the real-time database is also higher. In case of RDBMS, we might use HDD or hard disk or SSD, but still comparatively, the prices are much cheaper. So the second thing is volatile. As I mentioned, all of the data is present in the RAM itself. Since RAM is volatile, if we switch off our system and come back, the whole database will be gone. But because of using the disk, we can still recover all of the data. But there are different research going on to use NVRAM, which is also called as non-volatile RAM, which actually uses super uh, capacitors or uh, battery powered RAM, which actually still remembers what it had. In that case, we might doesn't really need disk um, to make it more reliable. We can use the NVRAM, but they are not still available in the market. So uh, in case of RDBMS, they are durable because once we write it to disk, until unless the disk itself crashes, they are really durable even though if you restart your system. So the performance is 100 times uh, more, as I mentioned here, and we also saw the read speed on different storages. So high performance, but in this case of this is not really high, it is low performance. So how do we basically recover? As I mentioned, we use VAL for recovery of the data uh, in case of RTDB. In case of RDBMS, we don't need really need to do anything that, like that. So no serialization is required in case of real-time databases. So if you, if you have any data, if you want to put it into storage, we need to serialize it in storage, right? So since we are in the RAM itself, RAM is like you basically access all of the data using pointers. You don't really save it into hard disk, so you don't really need to serialize the data. So that way we are also saving a lot of computation. But in case of RDBMS, we need to serialize all of the data. If it is number or if it is whatever, JSON, all of that stuff, you need to serialize and store it into the disk. So we need to spend a lot of computation to do that as well. So in case of uh, indexing, you know, right, we also need indexing in the RAM because um, even though it is faster, it is like variables stored in the in memory. Um, so, so you can say that why do we need indexing in case of RAM because all of the data can be accessed directly by ID. IDs can be variables and all of the data can be uh, the, like a data in the variable itself. Say um, in, in memory, you, you always know that the variable has all the value, right? Say for example, one, two, three. So if we have all the raw data here itself, so we can directly access. We don't really need indexing because it is it is much faster. Say, give me all the rec give me the record with the ID two. We basically access the data which is there in memory. In case of hard disk, we can't really do that because all of the data is present inside the file. You will need to do the scanning of a whole file to access the data. Um, so that's why we need indexing in hard disk. But in this case, also we need indexing just to support range queries. So that means that we still have to index on both the cases, but 
we don't really need to use B plus tree here. We will basically use AVL tree uh, for better performance because of the, the structures of this tree and the way they behave. So let's understand how indexing works in real-time database. Before that, let's also understand how B plus tree works in RDBMS and it gives you more idea about how the indexing works. So we know that making enabling the indexing on a table makes the queries faster because it enables the way to access the data much faster by using some extra data structures and memory. So in this case, B plus tree looks like this. In every node, uh, every node can actually contains one or more uh, children. So each node actually contains multiple data and each data represents the range of the data which actually holds in its sub subtree. And in all of these leaf nodes holds the data in some cases or the pointer or the reference back to the file um, position where the actual data of that particular indexed column presents. Um, so in this case, uh, this data structure is a tree, a tree structure, which is called as B plus tree structure. In this case, 1, 11, 25 are the values which we have indexed. What this one represent is all the substructure which holds is the indexed information from the range 1 to 11. So under this uh, point, uh, under this subtree, all the data from 11 to 25 is holds here. And under this subtree, which I have not written because it is so big, will actually hold all the information for the ID uh, from 25 or greater than 25. So suppose if I want to search the row with ID 9, then how we actually use B plus tree to search that is, we go to the root node and then we have to check this value which falls in the range of 9. So 9 actually falls between 1 and 11, right? So we had to go to this substructure and definitely it is not going to fall between 11 to 25 or 25 or not greater than 25. So we found that 9 is between 1 and 11. That means that the, all of the information which we need to access that row is here. So we go to the uh, children or child and here we have to do the same thing again. Is 9 is between 1 and 5? No, then means that the information is not over here is the value uh, here between 5 and 9 here it is not there is the value 9 is in this range greater than 9 yes definitely it is here and we go here and this particular record or the leaf uh, node actually holds the data or the reference or the positions or the offset to access that particular value so for 9 the offset is present here and we go to the offset of the file itself so this looks like a table in the representation, but the database itself is a file. Um, so we go to the ninth uh, offset, whatever, whatever the offset which is present here. So we access the row with the ID 9. So that's how the B plus tree work. And similarly, in case of AVL tree in real time database also works the same way. So if you know the AVL tree uh, structure, the left side of the subtree and the right side of the uh, subtree height should be always differing by one. If it is deferred by more, then we need to do some adjustment or uh, you know, uh, rotate the values to uh, retain that property. So that's what AVL tree is. And also it has the properties of all the properties of binary tree. That means that all the values uh, from the node, sh all the values which are greater than the node should be on the right side and all the values uh, which are less than the node's value should be on the left side. So in this case, the modified AVL tree is actually used for um, real-time database indexing. In this case, how it works is each node actually contains one or more elements, but in binary tree or AVL tree, we'll be having only one value, but in this case, we'll be having one or more value. So suppose we'll have three values, that is 10, 11, and 12. So these are the same values uh, which we wanted to index. So in this case, we have three values, that is 10, 11, and 12. What it also means that is the there can only be two children to every node, right? That is the uh, AVL tree property. So that means that on the left side of the tree, all the data which is less than the leftmost data on the node is present. That means that all the data over here is will be all the IDs which are less than this particular value that is 10. It means that it contains all the values which is less than 10. On the right side of the uh, subtree, all the values greater than the rightmost value here. That is means that all the values greater than 12 will be present here. Suppose if I want to find a row with ID 9, what happens now is 
first we'll go to the root uh, node here and we'll have to find uh, where exactly is it in the left side or the right side so we inspect the first value 10 okay is 9 less than 10 that means that we definitely know that all the indexed information present on the left side subtree so we go on the left side and here also we had to do the same uh, again so is 9 less than 6 no is 9 greater than 8 that means that all the indexed information present on this um, right side of the subtree so when we reach the leaf node that's where it might actually contains uh, the pointer information for the record which actually holds um, this particular record 9 it could be PTR4 and here it could be having tuple with 9 and all the information which we related so the only difference here is from the B tree is definitely uh, it contains all the you know binary tree properties and there we don't have the binary tree property and every node will have one or more uh, subtrees and here we only have two subtree one is left and right subtree and one more information uh, one more difference is every node also can contains pointer so in this case if I'm looking for 10th um, a row with an ID 10 that means that we definitely know that this itself and this particular node itself actually contains the pointer to the 10th um, row with ID 10 so that means that pointer 1 it could be pointing somewhere here so if I'm looking for 18 in that case we know that okay we have to go to the root node uh, is 18 less than 10 no is 18 greater than 12 that means that it goes here and then we have to check from here is 18 less than or equal to 18 over here we know that means that so this itself is equal to pointing to somewhere here so one more interesting property to observe over here is all the data structure actually retains the sorted order of the index okay so if you see here 3 4 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 and similarly here 1 so if you see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 11. So this, this structure also holds the um, uh, data in order, also called as sorted order. And also searching is always faster, which is always in uh, logarithmic of n co time complexity. So I think I've covered all of that. So you might be asking or you might be thinking, if we are dealing with in-memory, why don't we just use a big hash table and and find the location of the record itself. So we can always find the record uh, like, like a big hash table, right? So if I want to search um, in a ninth record, hash of nine, and I can find the pointer where the data present, it, it works well, but we can't really do the range query. The, for the range query, we need to have an indexing data structure. This data structure actually helps in range query only. If you want to just find one spe specific element, we can actually do hash of that particular ID which we are looking for and then we can actually figure out the pointer as well so when we want to do range query like select star you know from table between ID this to that then we can do say between 10 to 20 all we have to do is go to the root node 10 and 12 so we know that all the data from here and then we need to look for 20 20 is greater than 12 we go here and here here and 20 and equal to so we'll have to get all the data from here, 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 and here, here, here. So we get the data, and that is much faster. Um, otherwise, we should uh, we can't really do the range query on the hash data structure, right? So that's why we need uh, indexing um, indexing on real-time database as well. So not just AVL tree, you can actually use a lot of different data structure to create indexes with to make your data access patterns faster. So you can use arrays, which actually uses a lot of minimal spaces and also index size, total size itself is predictable. But the only problem is the update to the index complexity is order of n. So there are other algorithms like chained bucket hashing, which you can use or extendable hashing, linear hashing and uh, modified linear hashing also. But I'm not going to explain all of those because this is out of context right now. So now let's understand how durability is handled in real time databases. So if you know the word durability, it means that if you write something to a system, the data should be always present. That's what durability means. Now, in this case, in the process of making query faster, we sacrificed something because, you know, RAM is so much volatile. That means that any data which is present in there after the system crashes or restarts, all of the data is vanished. Then how do we make the system more durable? For this, we'll have to consider 
one approach called as write ahead log, which is also called as wall files. The whole process is also used in RDBMS for making it durable as well. And the same um, design is also used in real time database. What happens is one more thing you need to understand about hard disks are appends are much faster. The append operation to the file is much faster because of one reason in hard disk, the spinning disk will be uh, rotating and the, uh, the head of the hard disk will be keep on moving in the same direction and the sectors um, are lined sequentially. So anything which you append to a file is actually written sequentially. You don't need to uh, move the head of the hard disk randomly over here. So the data, uh, you know, IO operation will be much faster. So let's take that um, feature as a leverage and then design the system to make um, uh, this system much durable. So what happens is when the query is made from the client to the real time database, the query appears in the query engine. The query engine has two things to do. The first one is it has to write uh, all the data into the whatever data structure we had. So we had indexing data structure. And also we'll actually have the data structure, which could be a you know pointer in the data. Or it, you can think of it as a hash table, which has a pointer and um, you know values as a tuple, Let's say ID, name and age. So values will be present like that. So basically this query engine will actually write the data into this data structures, update the indexes. And also it is responsible to write the query like DML query and DDL query. We don't need to write the select queries, um, which are just the reads, right? We are going to persist the DML and DTL queries into a file. Maybe it can be done in the background thread as well. Um, or the query engine can take care. It's always better to hand it over to background thread. What happens now is all the queries like update queries um, and you know, create creation of the tables and all those sort of that queries will actually will be sent in, into val file as well. And those instructions are keep on written into this file. We don't need to do much. We just need to keep appending all the queries which have done so far into this file. So, and there's one more approach also to this. So we also need to seek, you know, periodically take the backup of all of this data structure into a backup file. So two things are happening here. So this could be also a background thread, which are, which is maybe a, you know timed to a specific interval. In Redis, we have a setting uh, to set that um, you know, snapshotting time, which actually you can set it to 10 minutes, means all of the database is taken as a snapshot uh, into a backup database into the disk, okay? So this is cheaper. So this is the one which makes faster and costlier. So we can keep dumping all of the state of the database into the disk. And in future, if you want to make it even more durable, uh, what we, what people do is we can take this backup and put it into S3 as well. So that's out of the topic now. So two things are happening here. All the DML and DDL queries are written into val file. And also periodically we are taking a snapshot of all of this structure and dumping it to a backup. So both of these things are present in our disk. You might be asking, why do we need to keep on storing this um, queries into a file? The advantage is if the system crashes or if the system restarts, then all of the data inside uh, RAM in the database will be empty, right? Now we need to create everything. So what we can do simply is replay all of these queries from the beginning of the file. You will actually end up in the same state when the system crashed. It means that say, if you have created a table, updated um, some rows, inserted some rows, or deleted some rows, you basically replay in the same sequential order. So all of the data will be re you know, reproduced or recreated in the structures. So that way we will get back the data. Because when the system crashes, we don't lose this data because this is persistent. Only we will lose this data. So we'll get back all the data. But you might be asking now, what if we are making billions of queries and this file will definitely overload and the disk will fill out, right? So that's why, um, and also one more interesting thing is we might be updating the same row million times. Like some, for, for example, if you have a video and you will be updating the views count to that um, video, or if you have a Instagram post or something, you might be recording the number of likes to that post. So basically you are updating the same row or you might be updating the status of uh, some record, like status is beginning, uh, started, uh, created, processed, uh, finished, delivered, shipped. So you'll be having um, you know, five, five to 10 different statements for, for the same record, which are, which are update statements. Basically the end state is the last query which we need. So we need to do some, some optimization for this file to make the, uh, you know, uh, 
to make the data of a small size. So what we can do is we have to do some process called as compaction. Uh, when we do the compaction on this val file, the val file will become very smaller. What we actually do is instead of capturing all the previous um, statements, we only capture the we when the compaction happens, we will delete all the previous uh, statements and we will only retain the last statement. For example, when we uh, execute a query called as update the status to you know create it. So if you, if you have an update statement, uh, status set to created, and the next query may be set to um, started, just an example, uh, processed, and then say shipped, and then finished. So in this case, we have five different queries over here. So there is no point in replaying um, uh, you know, logs of this file on this database um, like all of these queries. So there is no point in replaying all the queries because the end state is only this one, right? Because finally in the database, we'll have this as the uh, you know, final state of the data. So the compaction process can identify these kind of queries. We can basically delete all of these things and we can only preserve these things. So when we, when we, um, when we run the comp compaction, this is what it does. It will identify all of these kind of queries and then making it to very simple so that database file is, for example, now it is reduced by five times. So that's kind of optimization. So we will live, never run out of disk. And you might be asking, even after doing compaction, we might suffer the same, even still this file might be big. So one more uh, optimization is, so we know when we have taken the snapshot of this database, right? So at any given point of time, say T, if you take on the snapshot, we can delete all the logs prior to that. So there is no point to replay that one, right? Because we already have taken that snapshot at point of the T. That means that we have taken a state snapshot. So all the logs in that log file older than T can be deleted. We don't need to replay that because we already have a state until then. So that way also we can keep on clearing this file or we can have a new wall files every time in that snapshot is taken. So old file can be straight away deleted. Uh, so this, these are the ways uh, we can make uh, the system more durable. So what about high availability? So high availability is somewhat similar to RDBMS system as well, uh, which in, in which case we have a hot uh, standby uh, backup machine, which also have the latest state of all the data, which is there in the master. It's like a master slave. Once the master goes down, you basically switch to the you know, slave uh, real-time database. It works the similar way how RDBMS works. And apart from that, if you look at the performance, of real-time uh, database versus RDBMS, uh, the transaction per uh, second actually sh is huge. Uh, there's a huge difference between a real-time database versus RDBMS. So that's the kind of advantage. And also initially I mentioned that the query time in, um, in the real-time database versus RDBMS is like 100 times difference. So that's the kind of performance you get by using real-time database in your systems. Um, apart from that, one more important thing to uh, know is what happens, um, uh, what is the limit of the RAM you can get it on your server? So in your server, as of now, we get up, we can set up up to 300 to 400 gigabytes of RAM in each server. What if we want to store more data other than that? Uh, like maybe we want to store two terabytes of data in our system, what do we do that? Then we have to go for sharding. These principles still remains the same like RDBMS. So to understand more, let's you take one use case and understand better to know why exactly we need real-time databases um, other than RDBMS. So the uh, use case is called as real-time bidding, also called as RTB. So where the bidding for advertisement impression happens, uh, where there is always suppliers and there is always a demand, um, there is supply and demand, that's where you always need an exchange who actually meets the supply to the demand. So what happens here is, so there will be hundreds of companies who are trying to uh, show one ad to any given user. This system will actually decide who is the winner and they, it is going to select that particular company's advertisement and show it to the user. To look at the scale of the system, there is billions of users who will be requesting to be shown, uh, to show ad on their respective web pages which they are browsing. So there'll be hundreds or thousands of advertisements who wants to show their ads. Um, 
So how this system works is, suppose if I want to buy a car, what I do is I obviously do Google search or maybe I'll be searching in Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or the reviews on different websites. So Google definitely will know that I am searching for cars recently, that most probably that I might end up buying a car. So before that, before I buy the car, their responsibility is to show different companies advertisements to me to change my mind to buy a specific product. So there'll be hundreds of companies or there could be a handful of companies who wants to show car advertisements specifically. So there could be Ford, which is wants, uh, wants to show advertisements to me as well. And there is Maruti Suzuki also wants to show. There is Kia or, or there is BMW, which um, all of these companies want to show an advertisement. So I actually see the advertisement. Most likely, if I'm interested in that car, I might end up buying. So there is always competition in showing a specific ad to a specific person. Um, since these uh, real-time bidding companies also have access to all of my information, say for example, Google AdWords have, he does know about uh, all about me based on all of the information they collect from Gmail to Hangouts or you know from Android phones. Um, they definitely know how much I earn, uh, what is my favorite color, what is my age, and where do I live. All of based on all of these different attributes, they know exactly what kind of ads to be shown. So when, when I browse a page, say for example, if I'm browsing a page, there will be advertisement in that page. When I am loading this page, the advertisement request will actually go to this real-time bidding exchange. And this guys are the system based on all of the information they know about me. And they will uh, actually select the advertisers and they show an ad here. The way bidding happens is, if there are four different companies, as I mentioned, Ford, uh, Maruti, and Kia, and BMW, and they would have set specific prices. Um, uh, if that price meets, then they will show the ad. So whoever has set a higher uh, price, they are the winner, and this exchange will actually uh, pick that user's advertisement and then or pick that company's advertisement and show it over here. So that's how bidding happens. But if you look at the scale, there is billions of requests coming, and there is a lot of advertisements to be, uh, you know, bid and then compare, uh, do a lot of transactions. So there is a lot of complicated processing actually happening here, and there is tons of data which is stored in the database. Why do we really need real-time database over here? You might be thinking, why can't we just use RDBMS or NoSQL over here? So when I browse the page, there is advertisement plugin which actually shows the advertisement. Usually the load time for this whole page is, let's take uh, 200 milliseconds. So that means that all of the resources should be downloaded. And once the page is actually uh, start to uh, render, before that we actually make a request to get an ad. Maybe it has already, there is like 150 millisecond already happened to download all the CSS and JS. And all the JS uh, related to this advertisements is, uh, is also downloaded. And after 150 milliseconds, the request will actually go to real-time database from the user. Now, real-time database should actually bid and select a winner so that they can show an ad over here. Now, you have the, the goal is to actually show the advertisement as soon as the page rendering or you know the page has loaded. That is before 200 millisecond or you can show later as well. Most likely what happens is I might be already uh, seeing the content over here in the page and I would have closed the page or I would have scrolled and went to a different position in the page so that this advertisement is already hidden. So the goal here is to show as soon as possible to get the attention of the user. So, so you basically have only 50 millisecond left with you to decide which advertisement to be shown here. That means that your system should be highly performant or the performance of the system should be very high as to decide the advertiser advertisement to be shown and do all of the transaction, increase the counter, whatever it's supposed to do and also uh, res respond to this page for that advertisement to be shown. So within 50 milliseconds, you actually should um, uh, display this advertisements. That's the you know timeline. So if you just use RDBMS over here, what happens is most likely that you can't really achieve all of this thing within millisecond. Maybe you'll be spending 500 millisecond or even higher than that, or maybe one second. Uh, to give a uh, comparison, if say for example one query is taking in um, you know 100 millisecond in RDBMS. The same query actually works in one millisecond in real-time database.
So how cool is that? It's like you will get 100 times performance improvement if you just use real-time database over RDBMS. So these are the use cases where so when you have very limited time to process something and you want to query and then do all of a lot of things and then show, then most likely that you will actually end up using real-time databases. I hope I have covered uh, enough information about real-time databases. Uh, if you like this video, please uh, like and share. Thanks a lot.